And that Christ is risen. Amen. He is risen indeed. Well, last Sunday morning, we stepped away from our series in the Gospel of Mark, and we began a, a three-Sunday stop in John as we kind of consider some passages that are not in uh, the Gospel of, of Mark. Not that the Gospel of Mark is insufficient, just every writer is coming from a different perspective and all these kinds of things. And so so here as we, cons- we last Sunday we were in John 14, and we will continue in John 14 today, but at the end of the chapter. Last week we were at the beginning of John 14, this week we'll be at the end of John 14, and next week we'll jump to John 20. Um, as we consider the placement of where we are in in uh, context, where we are right now in John 14 is on the Thursday of what we mentioned earlier is kind of the whole Holy Week between Palm Sunday when Jesus rode uh, triumphantly into Jerusalem to the palm trees and the coats laid out in the streets for him and uh, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord between the Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday. See, it was on this Thursday that, that Jesus uh, was in the upper room with his disciples where he headed off to uh, pray in the Garden of Gethsemane and was betrayed and arrested there, leading to his trial and eventual crucifixion and then glorious resurrection. And some of the events that we talked about last time just kind of remind you of the, of the situation of the upper room up to this point. Jesus has washed the feet of his disciples. This is an unusual night. He's washed the feet of the disciples. And then he's, then Jesus tells them that one of them, one of the 12, one of them who had spent the last several years, three years with Jesus would now betray him. Jesus goes on to tell the disciples that he will only be with them for a short while longer. Now where he's going, they cannot go, at least not yet. And then finally, Jesus tells Peter. Peter's one of his closest friends, one of the inner three, Peter, James, and John, those closest to Jesus. He tells Peter, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. So before morning, you will deny me three times. And all this leaves the disciples sorrowful, confused, and certainly afraid as well. As you may remember from last Sunday, Jesus comforted his disciples with the words in John 14, One, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. This morning's passage here at the end of the chapter continues words of comfort and instruction for the disciples there in the upper room. If you're able, I invite you to stand. We're going to begin in verse 23 as we read the word of God together. John 14, 23 through the end of the chapter, excuse me, 25 through the end of the chapter. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I will come to you. If you love me, you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, minister to us now through the power and work of your Holy Spirit as your word is opened and proclaimed. We know that your word does not return void. Lord, we pray that, we'll, it will, that you will accomplish your good purposes in our midst now. Lord, we pray for hearts that are soft and malleable, that we be receptive to the working of your word, working of your spirit in us. Lord, help us 
to walk away different than when we came in. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you may be seated. The uh, outline for this morning's message begins, well, it's a three-part three outline if you're a note taker, and we begin with hope of a helper. Hope of a helper. As Jesus begins and speaks to the disciples, he's speaking to these men who have been faithful students of Jesus for the last three years. They have watched him carefully as he has taught, as he has ministered, but they've also been students of all that he has said and done. And Jesus seems to anticipate fear among them, a fear of forgetting some or, or all that they've been taught in their time with Jesus. And Jesus assures them, he assures them of the hope of a helper. Hope of a helper. This help was spoken of a few verses ago. We skipped over some of the verses in between uh, the beginning and the end of the chapter. But in verse 16, it says, And I will ask the Father, Jesus is speaking, and I will ask the Father, and He will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. Here, In verse 26, in the passage that we read this morning, the helper, the spirit of truth is clarified to be the Holy Spirit who is being sent by the Father representing the Son. This helper, this counselor, advocate is the Holy Spirit and is is said to have a couple of roles here in this passage. But before we get into that and, and look at these in particular, I think it's important to to point out how the Holy Spirit is discussed here. And honestly, I think there is much confusion in Christianity around the person of the Holy Spirit. Probably the most confused of the three members of the Trinity. And so here, as we we look at this passage, I want to just offer a few clarifying thoughts as we think about who the Holy Spirit is before we talk about the role or what the Holy Spirit will do in the lives of the disciples. And so to be clear, the Holy Spirit is a he, as verse 26 says. He's not an it, as if he were some spiritual force or a powerful influence. He is a person. The Holy Spirit is a he, a person. And a person cannot be divided or he ceases to be a person. I don't know if any of you have ever been to a, maybe a, a magic show or you watch one of those on TV and they have somebody come up and lay down in a box and then they saw them in half and then open up the, the box and looks like they're in two and then miraculously they put it back together and they're one again. Well, uh, if I were in that box and I got sawed in half and it didn't go well and I ended up in two, I'd no longer be a person. I'd be in multiple pieces, wouldn't I? Uh, The point here is that a person cannot be divided and still be a person. The application here, as it relates to how we think of the Holy Spirit, is that you cannot have part of or more or less of the Holy Spirit. At conversion, the Holy Spirit came to live and dwell inside each person who believes. The person of the Holy Spirit. And so you don't get more or less. Now, now, to be fair, sometimes the Spirit works more powerfully in us. Amen. Sometimes the evidence of the Spirit is, is more profound. Now, sometimes we submit to the working of the Holy Spirit more times than others, or more than others, but, but you never have more or less of the Holy Spirit. Again, you get Him at conversion. He is a seal, guarantee of your salvation. And so the Holy Spirit is a person. He is the third person of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He is of the same essence and nature as God the Father and God the Son. Everything of the character of God the Father, everything of the character that might be said of of God the Son could be said of God the Holy Spirit. He is fully God, eternal and personal. And the sending that Jesus mentions in verse 26, the sending of this helper, the Holy Spirit, is recorded in Acts. And you may be making the connection to to Pentecost. Yes, it's the, the sending of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came down on all who believe. And then from that day forward, everyone 
at their conversion is indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Is The Holy Spirit comes and, and resides within and is that seal, that guarantee of the work of God and of salvation in us, as I mentioned before. So if you've surrendered to Christ, to his, his Holy Spirit dwells in you. But what is that to... But what is it that Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will do for the disciples in today's text? Well, two things are mentioned here that I want to point out to you. The first is this. He, it says that he will teach you all things, first of all. And secondly, he will bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you, Jesus says. So the role of the, the Holy Spirit is described in, in two ways in this context. And so... If I'm going to give him a name, he's a teacher, first of all. And then if you'll, I, I think it's a made up word. It, it may be a real word, but remembrancer is what I'm going to throw at you here. Okay. The Holy Spirit is a, a remembrancer. And let's talk about him as a teacher first. First in the role of the Holy Spirit as a teacher. Uh, the, the promise to disciples is is not that they would know everything possible for them to know. Jesus said, he will teach you all things. It's, just, it's not that anything in the world that could possibly be known, the Holy Spirit will teach you, like you'll become omniscient and all-knowing like, like God. No, it, instead, the disciples have not understood everything that Jesus has taught them. You, you probably recognize this as you've read through uh, the Gospels. The disciples didn't get it all. There was much that they had not yet understood or that they had misunderstood. But the promise here is that the Holy Spirit will be their teacher. The Holy Spirit will be their teacher. All that Jesus had taught them in his time with them, the Holy Spirit would lead them to understand. So the Holy Spirit is a teacher in this sense. And then in the role as a remembrancer. The Holy Spirit would bring to mind, help them to remember all that Jesus had said to them. So they need not worry about forgetting what Jesus had taught them. The Holy Spirit would enable them to remember that which Jesus had taught them. So three things that the work of the Holy Spirit gives in light of, of this. To the, to the eleven, you remember Judas is gone at this point. To the eleven it gives confidence and hope. Confidence and hope. The disciples had, had not understood everything that Jesus had taught, and this news of the Holy Spirit gave them confidence that they would both understand and remember all that Jesus had taught them. What, what a relief to know that, that though Jesus is leaving, they will be able to remember, they have another helper that will help them remember and understand all that Jesus had taught them. To us, it gives, gives us confidence as we read the New Testament, as we read the Bible uh, for, as a whole, for that matter. So the Bible, of course, is God's Word. It is, all Scripture is breathed out by God from a practical standpoint, or maybe even an apologetic standpoint, as we think about defending our faith. This reassures us that the New Testament writers understood what Jesus was teaching. They're not writing something down in the Gospels that that they misunderstood as Jesus was teaching. The Holy Spirit was given to help them remember and understand everything that Jesus had taught. And so we can, of course, for multiple reasons, have confidence in the, whole, in the Scriptures, but this is another example of why we can. See, not only were the biblical authors moved by the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit enabled them to remember and understand all things from Jesus. So, so just as they could remember and know the truth, we can know the truth of God as we open our Bibles and trust them. Third, what we learn about the Holy Spirit gives us confidence when we, when we share our faith with other people. The promise here is to the disciples, granted, but there's application for all of us as well. Just think back to, to Luke 12, uh, verses 11 and 12, where Jesus said, When they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Now, we should be prepared to give a, a reason for the hope that is in us. We should study to show ourselves approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We should be a student of the word. We should study to show ourselves approved. But when you get the opportunity to share your faith, relax. The Holy Spirit will help you. 
You will be able to, to remember and apply things as, as, a, as the Lord would have us to. So trust the Holy Spirit to give you what you need as you share the gospel with another. That's what Jesus is teaching there in Luke. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. So Jesus promises the disciples the hope of a helper, the Holy Spirit that would teach them and help them to remember. The Holy Teacher would be the teacher and remembrancer for them. But the second promise is the promise of peace. Remember, he's offering comfort to them as he repeats uh, again to the disciples, peace I leave with you, let not your hearts be troubled. So this promise of peace. Peace or or shalom would have been a customary greeting and a farewell. But here in verse 27, Jesus is not saying hello or goodbye to the disciples. He's saying much more. He is promising that he is going to give them, he is giving them peace. Now, the New Testament occurred at a time that is known in history as uh, Pax Romana. It is a period of 200 years of peace for Rome. Now, peace was won by Rome and maintained through the, the force and the power of the sword. And some thought that the Messiah would bring an either even mightier sword, that, uh, that through his sword, wielding the sword, he would bring his kingdom. But in fact, the peace of the Messiah comes not by the sword, but through suffering. And Jesus was clear that the peace that he left them, the peace that he gives, is unlike the peace of the world. Aren't you thankful for that? That the peace that we have in Christ is not a peace that the world gives, a temporary peace, a, a peace that comes and goes, but we have a peace that sustains. The world's peace is temporary. The Lord's peace is his peace, Jesus' peace, is eternal. The world's peace depends on circumstances. It comes and goes. Depending on what's going on in your life, you may have peace, you may not have peace. But the peace that Jesus offers, it, it, it depends upon Him, and He is unchanging. And so what is this peace? You know, we spend our whole lives seeking peace, I think, seeking satisfaction, seeking rest, not that we universally seek ease, though many of us do, but I think we think we seek something deeper, a stillness of soul and a peace for our hearts and minds that seems to evade us. You know, peace might be described as, a, as an absence of conflict, an absence of, of turmoil, but no amount of money, no worldly comforts, no prosperity in this life is ever going to bring the stillness that your soul craves. Augustine, the uh, pastor from the fourth century, put it this way. Speaking of God, says, Because you have made us for yourself, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. That's the truth of our hearts. We will never find peace. We will never find rest until we find our rest in Him. You see, apart from Jesus, there can be no absence of conflict. We cannot be without conflict because apart from Jesus, we are in a state of conflict with God. We are enemies of God, rebels of His, rebelling against God's law and against His Lordship in our lives. And until this reality is resolved, until we are reconciled to God, no amount of effort, no material possession will ever bring true and lasting peace. But once this is resolved, once we are reconciled to God, get this, there is no external worldly conflict that can ever rid you of the true and lasting peace that Jesus Christ brings. Situations can't rock it. Storms can't chase it away. The peace that Jesus gives is a peace that sustains forever. And Jesus has made a way for us to be right with God and experience this true and lasting peace. And it is through His perfect righteousness and His perfect sacrifice. So what then is required of us in light of what Christ has done? It is reliance upon His righteousness. That's our third point. Reliance 
on his righteousness. Jesus says in verse 30, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. Well, what exactly does this mean? Well, maybe you're, uh, you're into those crime shows. You watch Law and Order, and CSI, and you've heard someone that's accused of a crime or they're undergoing a vest investigation that might say something like, they've got nothing on me. Well, when someone says something like that, generally they mean one of two things. First may be, well, I've done wrong, but you're not going to be able to find evidence. You're not going to be able to find proof. You're not going to be able to make show that I'm guilty of this. The second thing is, if you say they've got nothing on me, they would mean I have done no wrong. There is nothing they can charge me with. They're not going to be able to find any evidence because I haven't done anything wrong. Well, here... When Jesus says, he has no claim on me, Jesus says something that only he could say. Only he can say, I am innocent. Jesus and Jesus alone can utter those words ultimately. One commentator writes of this, this verse, Jesus was telling his disciples that Satan was about to make his last and most violent attack on him. He was mustering all his strength for one more tremendous onset. He was coming up with his most utmost malice to try Jesus on the cross of Calvary. But our beloved master declares, he has no claim on me. Amen. Jesus can say this because he lived a life that we can't imagine. See, his life was a, a sinless one, a, a life of complete and utter purity of mind and heart and action in every sense. Christ was obedient and sinless. There is not a single hole in his defense. There is no kink in his armor. Jesus kept the law of God perfectly. As he says in, in verse 31, which we just read, I do as the Father has commanded me. So no matter what the, the great accuser Satan might throw at Jesus, Jesus can confidently respond, he has no claim on me. He cannot condemn me me. I am innocent. But you see, here's the problem. No one can respond to the accusations of Satan the way that Jesus did. Not Abraham, not our heroes of the, of the Bible, not Noah, not Moses or Elijah who've been up with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, not David, certainly not you and me. On our own, we cannot make such a claim. We cannot say, I am innocent. We can't say, he has no claim on me. We can't say of Satan, he's got nothing on me. Because apart from the work of Jesus Christ, he does. He's got plenty. We have done wrong. Our lives are full of sin and there is plenty of evidence. And even when our actions on the outside appear to be okay to others, we fail to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind and all of our strength. Even when we do right, oftentimes our actions, our motives, our motives are, are impure. But the beauty of it all is that this truth about Jesus, that he was 100% without sin. The beauty of that, of, of this truth, is the exact thing that qualifies Jesus to be what we need. His sinlessness, his perfection, enables him to be the perfect sacrifice for sinful man. This is what Jesus did to meet our greatest need lived a perfect life, laid that life down, and rose, it up, rose up again. You see, in our sin, we are guilty. We are separated from God, and we are deserving of judgment. In fact, there is nothing that we can do on our own to change the situation. The Bible describes us as dead in our sin. We need someone to pay our debt for us. We have nothing that can satisfy the debt outside of just of, our, of ourselves. We need someone to stand in our place to pay our debt. We are guilty and in need of a substitute. Scripture teaches us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no forgiveness of sins. See, it took a perfect sacrifice to atone, to atone for sinful men. 
And that's what Jesus came to be. The sinless Lamb of God, as John the Baptist declared, without spot or blemish, the only suitable sacrifice for sinful men. It's the only way it could be. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Jesus' death on the cross, though it may seem to, to the disciples as a victory for Satan, is nothing of the sort. You see, instead, this is the very plan of God from before the foundation of the world. This is how sinners would be redeemed. And it is through the perfect obedience of the Son to the Father in keeping with the plan within the Trinity from before the foundation of the world that Jesus secures the victory over sin and death and hell for all who believe on His name. You see, where before you and I could never say He has no claim on me, now because of the resurrection, Christ gloriously and victoriously stands and points to you and me and declares to Satan, you have no claim on Him. Praise God. Let me say that again. If you are in Christ, then Satan triumphantly, then Jesus triumphantly declares over you, Satan has no claim on him. No claim. Praise God. You see, because of this victory, when Satan accuses those of us who have placed our faith in Christ, when we have placed our trust in him, when he says to you, you are a terrible sinner and undeserving of forgiveness, you have no re there's no reason why you should have eternal life with God. We can say, yes, I know, but I have a great Savior. You see, through repentance and faith, we are made right with God. Through Jesus Christ, the conflict that I was telling you about before, this enmity between God and man can be made right through the blood of Jesus. Through Jesus Christ, that, that conflict that left us without peace is gone. And as Colossians 1, 19 and 20 teaches us, Christ has done all that was necessary to reconcile us to himself, making peace by the blood of his cross. All that was necessary to make us right before God has been done in the work of Jesus. So don't rely on your own righteousness. Rely on his righteousness. Rely on the one who says he has no claim on me and now declares over you, Satan has no claim on you. As we come to a close, I want you to hear the lyrics of a, of a hymn. It says, Christ has for sin atonement made. What a wonderful Savior. We are redeemed. The price is paid. What a wonderful Savior. I praise him for the cleansing blood. What a wonderful Savior that reconciled my soul to God. What a wonderful Savior. He cleansed my heart from all its sin, and now he reigns and rules therein. What a wonderful Savior. Do you know that wonderful Savior? And if you do, are you resting in him and his work today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a wonderful Savior. As we consider the plight of our sin, that we are stuck in guilt and condemnation apart from the work of Jesus Christ, and then hear that through faith and repentance that Jesus would declare over us he has no claim on him. We can do nothing but praise you. Thanking you, Lord, for this gift of salvation. What a wonderful Savior. Heavenly Father, if there be any here who do not know this wonderful Savior, I pray that over the next few moments as we sing and pray that they would give their lives to you that they would turn from their sin turn to Christ believing 
upon Jesus and what he has done to secure our salvation. Father, for those of us who are Christians, Lord, help us to just glory in this wonderful reminder that our sin has been dealt with once and for all through the blood of Jesus Christ. That we can be called children of God. That this enmity that once was ours is no longer. That we've been brought into the family of God. And Lord, use this to drive us to worship, motivate us to right living. And Lord, all the glory goes to you. We pray this thing.